I'm Samuel Burke and this is iReport for CNN coming to you from the Consumer Electronics Show 2014 in Las Vegas. We're going to be looking at the photos and videos you've uploaded to iReport.com. Plus, we'll scour the digital landscape to see how technology and user-generated content are reshaping our world. Plus, I'll be taking a spin with Bluetooth basketballs and even a spin in a driverless car. Let's get started. So what is the Consumer Electronics Show? CES is an annual conference, the biggest tech expo in the world. It's been happening since 1967 here in Las Vegas. And you have some of the biggest names in technology like Microsoft, Sony, and Samsung. Some of the trends that we're seeing this year have to do with televisions, curved televisions at 4K image quality, better than HD, and even bendable televisions. Samsung already had curved televisions, so what's different about these new curved televisions that you're releasing at CES? Yeah, the difference about these uh, this year is it's all about the ultra high def, the UHD 4K, and the combination of that stunning technology and experience you get from 4K combined with the immersive experience you get when you have a curved television really is something that creates a unique experience. Tim, when I look at these curved televisions, I feel they're better. I kind of feel like I'm in the picture, I'm in the motion, but I also feel like my wallet could hurt. We don't know exactly what the prices on these are going to be, but they're very expensive for people. So do you really think that my mom and dad are going to have these in their living room anytime well, soon? Uh, we think uh, that this is a really growing category. Um, the first, the UHD or the ultra high def, which delivers 4K or four times the resolution. When do you think that most people are going to have these in their living room by? Well, if we look out uh, a couple years, you know, this year will probably be less than a million units, but it's still a significant amount of the big screen TVs in the U.S. If we project out uh, over the next three or four years, uh, we can see this becoming eight to ten million units, which represents most of the big screen TVs that exist out there. I think the important thing with the curved displays is that they're taking this technology and they're not just putting it in their giant, you know, prohibitively expensive televisions, 85 inch, 100 inch, that cost tens of thousands of dollars. They're taking it and putting it into TVs that are 40, 50 inches, stuff that actually gets into the homes of mass consumers. So this is the bendable television. Can I literally just walk up and start bending it with my hands? Not quite that way, but you can with a remote control. And with a simple press of the button, it enables you to actually change the shape uh, of the television. And this is really a technology demonstration about the capabilities, about where the future in display technology is going. So this isn't something that you're releasing tomorrow. It's where Samsung sees things going. Can I take one home? You got it. Another big trend that we're seeing at CES are all types of gadgets connected to your smartphone, including this basketball called 9450. It'll cost you nearly 300 bucks, but through Bluetooth, it connects to your smartphone and an app will tell you how to improve your dribble. It tells you if you need to go slower, faster, and then it collects your data and tells you day by day if you're getting better or worse. I need some work on my spin, so I might be better off taking a spin in a driverless car. I'm being chauffeured around Las Vegas, not in the back of a limousine going down the famous strip. I'm actually in the back of a car where the man behind the wheel isn't even touching the wheel. What exactly is the car doing when you don't have your hands on the wheel? Well, it's using its outside sensors to form a picture of what's happening on the road right now. So it's looking at the cars, it's looking at the lines, it's looking at road boundaries. Then it's basing its decisions, following the car in front. I think it would take a while before I just trusted it. If it cannot follow or if it's in any way unclear, it's asking me to take over, which I just did. It kind of reminds me of Bewitched, that American series about the housewife witch, because I see your hands there not touching anything and this steering wheel is moving back and forth. So it really makes me feel like there's some type of magic going on. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just can't wiggle my nose the way Nicole Kidman can. It's not so black and white. I think we think of a car with a driver or a car without a driver. This is kind of like an airplane that uses a pilot, but sometimes it goes into autopilot. You can just say, hey, I don't want to drive right now, just take over, and if I want to, want to be back in the driver's seat, I'll just grasp the wheel and go. In the state of Nevada, an amateur like me isn't allowed to drive a driverless car just yet. 
but maybe in a few years I can get in here and let my hands rest. This is what the technology was looking like at last year's CES, right? Exactly. And now it's looking like that. That's what you see inside here, exactly. We have in the car different sensors that we're using in the front, on the rear, what you see on, on the mirror of the camera. We have this eye here. So I just took a spin in one of these. It wasn't 100% smooth. It wasn't just driverless technology. You needed to drive behind the wheel. There were some sudden stops. What's the biggest challenge right now to get it to that next phase where you need the driver less? You know, I think that there's challenges that we're talking about. First of all is uh, the, the situations that you find outside, which when you drive and you're used to drive, it's for you, it's pretty simple. But if you look through sensors, the world is different. And if you had to sell it to me right now, if you had to, how much would you charge me with all that technology that you've crammed in here? Um, we don't talk about prices currently, you know. If there's one takeaway I have after being in that car, it's that we really shouldn't use the word driverless to describe those vehicles just yet. Those cars still need somebody behind the wheel, and it's only for a relatively short amount of time that you can take your hands off the steering wheel. We're about to head to a break, but when we come back, you already know that big tech companies can follow what you do online, but I'm gonna show you how companies like Facebook are figuring out what you're doing offline. Welcome back to iReport for CNN. I'm Samuel Burke at the Consumer Electronics Show here in Las Vegas. It's no longer a surprise when you search for something on one website and then start to see ads for exactly what you're searching for on other websites. The big tech companies are tracking what we do online. Now imagine that these companies knew what you were doing when you were offline, when you're not using a computer or your smartphone. You don't have to imagine. It's already happening, and for the first time ever, Facebook is talking on camera about this practice in this exclusive report. Santa can still look into his magic snowball and see just what you're up to. Just like Santa Claus in the classic cartoon. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Big tech companies not only know what their users are up to online, increasingly, they know what they're doing offline. Facebook is partnering with data collection firms that gather information from those customer loyalty cards used in many brick and mortar stores. Facebook's vice president of global marketing says the data is then used to create customized ads and deals to its more than one billion customers. I'll give you a very real example. Let's say that I am a heavy snack user and I buy snacks and we now have the ability through about 50% of purchase card data in the United States to tell a snack manufacturer that here are the consumers that have purchased snacks and allow that marketer to target them with a very specific ad. How can Facebook guarantee that all this data is anonymous? We have the data from, let's say, the grocery store, um, which is really purchase card data. We have that bucket of data. We have the Facebook data. Those two never shall meet in terms of us sharing specific Facebook information or them sharing very specific purchase information. So they would turn Samuel into a code that would never be identifiable as Samuel. You would be a set of characters. That procedure is called hashing. And despite this advance in securing information, privacy advocates are worried about tech companies collecting so much information. We do believe that hashing and more generally de-identification, which is a technique for anonymizing, that is to remove the actual information of the user, is a good privacy tool. And we favor it. But we think it also has to be tested independently. And we can't rely on Facebook's representations about whether they're doing a good enough job. Facebook says their business depends on keeping users' data secure. And they believe they'll prefer seeing ads and coupons customized to their tastes and habits. We firmly believe that the more relevant and useful the advertising can be, that it's in service of the consumer. Maybe more importantly for Facebook, the people paying their bills, the advertisers, see this customization as the holy grail. We want to be able to offer a marketer the opportunity to know precisely who they want to target to drive very specific business results, and that's incredibly valuable for them. Now Facebook's users will have to decide whether this type of data sharing is naughty or nice.
Now, don't kid yourself into thinking that Facebook is the only one doing this practice. Plenty of other tech firms are trying to connect your online world with your offline world. This is the future of targeted digital advertising. Remember, if the product like Facebook is free, you are the product. Before we leave the Consumer Electronics Show, we know you've heard so much about the bone-chilling weather on the east coast of the United States, but it's even affected us here in the warm, sunny desert in Las Vegas. So many of the people who come here to cover this event and the people who show their technology products in the booths behind me couldn't make it here when they had planned because of the weather there and the domino effect it had on the airline industry. We even talked to one tech insider who had flight after flight canceled, and because of that, he had to charter an airplane and bring his Staff here and it cost him more than $30,000 for that private jet. It shows just how important the Consumer Electronics Show is to the tech industry. I want to show you some of the images that iReporters have sent to us from up and down the East Coast. Check out those frosty photos. That's it for this edition of iReport. Remember, you can always send us your photos and videos to cnniReport.com. I'm Samuel Burke, and I'll see you in New York for the next edition of iReport for CNN.